The documentary is called The Hidden Face of Suicide, and the film's producer and director, Yehudi Silverman, joins us this week at the Roundtable. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. What inspired you to make this documentary? Well, I think that basically because there's still so much stigma and silence and shame around suicide. And I felt like I wanted to raise awareness about that and in some ways through the film break the silence about that. And you lived this personally. You were 17 years old when you discovered, you learned that your uncle had taken his own life, yet the family had never talked about it. No, that's right. Um, I, I knew that he had died, but I didn't know how he had died and I found out by accident. I, I discovered it when I was um, looking through some papers and I found it in an old newspaper. Hmm. And, it, and uh, I was really surprised and also very confused as to why there was this silence around it. And I think that was part of the motivation, was really trying to understand why would this be in secrecy? Why would this be something that people were too ashamed or too frightened or unsure of or uncomfortable? And so that was part of the uh, impetus. And when you were 17 and you asked questions about it, what was the response of the family? I didn't ask questions. You didn't? No, I, which was really interesting as that I found out and I didn't really say anything about it. So I kept it in. I actually perpetuated the silence. It was only through the making of this film and then on camera speaking to my parents, it was the first time we ever spoke about it. And that was a big part of the documentary yes. where you sit down with your parents and you, you ask them why for so many years the family just never discussed it. That's right, yeah, it was very important. And it really helped me to understand how the, the shame and the stigma around suicide affects families, how it affects those that are left behind. And that, that because of the shame and the stigma, they're feeling isolated and shunned at a time when they need the most support. And that, that was quite, um, I was really saddened by that, to hear that from my parents, that they felt a lot of shame and guilt, and that it was something that wasn't spoken about then, 50 years ago, and still isn't spoken about. And that stigma still exists today. Yes, it does. And that was part of um, my process of making the film, is, is I attended a group in Montreal called Family Survivors of Suicide, which is a self-help support group. And the word survivors is what they call themselves because they're the ones left behind. And this is a support group for anyone that's lost someone to suicide. And they meet uh, twice a month. And it's really a place where people can go who feel like no one can understand what they're going through. They feel shattered and they feel alone. And here, these are really the experts, right? These are people that have lived through it and they accept you no matter what. And so I attended their group for a year. And then um, one of the themes that came up, interestingly, was the theme of having to wear a mask, of not being able to show people how you feel and to have to hide behind a mask. Mm -hmm. So me being someone that comes from the arts, um, I asked them if they would participate in mask making, which they did. And so the mask really become an integral part of the film. They become a method of the survivors expressing how they feel, but also for the audience to have an understanding of what happens when we, wear, when we wear a mask, what happens when we hide behind a mask. So the mask really served the film in order to, to really tell the experience of those that are left behind. You are the chair of the uh, Creative Arts Therapies Department at Concordia University. Yes. Is this, is, is using art therapeutically, is that uh, much of what uh, uh, your department in, is all about? Absolutely. We have art, drama, and music, and there's also dance therapy. Um, and basically it's, it's the use of the art to promote therapeutic change. And it's, there's really a spectrum of practice. So it can be one-to-one -one in a hospital for someone who's experienced trauma. And you'd use the art as a tool to access areas that are often very hard to access cognitively. It's very hard to talk about, but you could do it through music, through art, through drama, through dance. But it's also used in community for social change, mm -hmm. to bring in those that are marginalized 
and isolated. So there's a very wide spectrum. It's used in schools and prisons and hospitals. You must see a, a number of survivors of suicide, though. That, that That's certainly uh, uh, a, a type of person who, uh, who probably keeps a lot of that inside and, mm -hmm. and, and doesn't probably deal with the uh, with a lot of, of their their traumatic loss mm-hmm and also when I my background is um, I was actually a professional dancer and then became a dance therapist and drama therapist and I worked as a therapist in uh, several different hospitals mm. and I did work with a lot of particularly suicidal adolescents mm. and I found that the arts were a very powerful way to access uh, the sense of deep sadness, isolation. And that's one of the things that I feel like is so important is to emphasize that we need to talk about suicide. You know, not stigmatize it, not remain silent. Because if we don't talk about it, those that are suicidal feel like they can't talk about it. You know, so we're isolating them more. We're perpetuating their suffering. And the survivors, if we can't talk about it, then they feel like they're stigmatized and they're in isolation. So I, I feel really strongly that we need to talk about it. And it seems in the documentary that the three survivors that you talked with, that, that the creation of the mask did work for them, that it, that it mm -hmm. truly was, seemed to be therapeutic. I think it was very helpful in terms of identifying um, how they were feeling now and also the idea, as one of them expressed so articulately, what's shown to the world and what's hidden. And I think that making of the mask was really uh, allowed them to identify this, work with it, and in a way be able to go beyond that. Because all of, of the survivors in the film, including my parents, uh, really found a sense of meaning by being able to potentially help others, by being able to tell their story so, so that perhaps others could not have to go through what they went through. And they're still learning how to survive. Absolutely. I mean, I think, and that's part of the, the reason that I made, particularly the beginning of the film is very slow. It's sort of the opposite of a Hollywood sensational, dramatic reenactment. Because uh, I feel like that's actually uh, destructive in terms of really talking about and expressing suicide. Because suicide is a complex issue. It's a very difficult issue. And also grief is very slow. So I feel like that the process of the film was slow. And you can mm. see that, that the survivors you talked with are still grieving, yes. still coping, yes. still struggling. Yes. And, and for some of them, still unanswered questions. Yes, well, I think that suicide always leave, but leaves behind unanswered questions because the person who has the story is gone. So it, it's always unanswered. And I think that's what's so difficult about it is that we have to live with the unknown because we don't know. We'll never know. And you talk with a mother who lost two sons to suicide. Yes. Yes. And she's actually, she's the one that started the group. She's an amazingly strong woman, and she's the facilitator of it. And I think that for her, it's, it's been very important to really try and break the silence and stigma. Because what happens if we have that stigma is we blame the families. So on top of suffering, then they're being blamed. And shunned. And, and, and shunned. As, as we heard from, from yes. one of the women you interviewed, yes. that, that they, she could instantly tell that, that people were shunning her and, and didn't want to talk with her. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which only made it worse. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it, you know, doesn't come from wanting to shun people. Some of it comes from not being sure what to say. Right. Right? right. We're, we're uncomfortable. We're not sure. And I think what's important is just to be present for the person and to name it. You know, I'm so sorry that you lost your loved one. I'm so sorry that they died by suicide. Yeah, people may Saying not know what it. to say and may be awkward. And, and exactly. exactly. Are we getting better, though, at... at understanding and, and raising awareness. We're, we're seeing more community events mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. uh, yearly walks like mm -hmm. the Out of the Darkness walk uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's held around locally here in, in uh, Lake Placid. It's been held for a few years mm -hmm. now. 
are we starting to, to take away some of the secrecy and, and, uh, and the, 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 the cloak of, of secrecy and darkness that, that surround it? I think it's better. I, I certainly think out of darkness and a show like this and, and, um, and survivors coming out and talking about it in a real and in-depth way is important. But it's still that like, you don't hear it very much at funerals. You don't hear it that much from religious leaders there's still a sense that it's a sin and that um, there's still stigma surrounding it. And I think that that needs to change. I think that survivors need to be supported by the very communities that they're a part of. We see, uh, with it being uh, National Suicide Prevention Awareness mm -hmm. Month in September, uh, we see polls that have been coming out recently that, that seem to indicate people are getting better at identifying mental illness mm -hmm. and depression mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the issues behind mm -hmm. suicide. Um, but do we still have a long ways to go? Are we making strides uh, in, 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 in our understanding, but uh, do we still really have a, a long ways to go? I think we're certainly making strides and so many people have written about it and um, made films about it. But I still feel there's a tremendous amount of isolation and um, silence surrounding mental illness and suicide. And I feel like that that really prevents people from getting help. And that the sense of being alone and isolated and feeling like it's never gonna change, right? Because when, um, when people decide that their only choice is to take their own life, it's usually not because they actually wanna end life, it's because they're suffering so much and they want to end the pain. So if, if we can help people to feel like they matter, that we're there for them, even if they're in a very dark place, I think that makes a difference. And to get help, you know, to reach out and get help. And know that if you feel suicidal, that's what you feel and it's okay to talk about it. Some you know? of these polls that we've seen also seem to indicate that that people are more prepared to say something than they would have been in, in past years. Mm -hmm. That if they see someone who's suffering mm -hmm. uh, from depression mm -hmm. or mental illness and, and, and see the warning signs that they, they actually say something mm -hmm. uh, where uh, for so long they, they would just look the other way. Mm -hmm. I think there is more awareness of that. Um, I think it's still very hard, particularly amongst high-risk groups like adolescents, like LGBTQ, like seniors. Seniors have a high risk of suicide and it's never talked about. That's one of the ones that's completely silent. But seniors do have, because they're isolated and because often they don't have a sense of meaning anymore, or purpose in their lives. Um, and also in Canada, First Nation and Inuit have a high risk mm. of suicide. So yeah, there's still a long way to go. And I, I think what's important, though, is really to be able to talk about it, to name it, to have it be a part of conversation, to not sensationalize it, and also to find avenues for expression, which is why I think the arts are so powerful. Was your career path at all decided by, by the fact that you had discovered this as a teenager? Did that uh, have yeah. any influence on you choosing this as a career path? I don't know. Um, I can't say yeah, so that. So it wasn't obvious. Uh. No, but I think that something that's been very important in my films and in my work is to bring things out of the shadows, is to bring things that are taboo and not talked about, and there's a lot of shame around it to bring it forward. Uh, in my first film, which was about using myth and fairy tale in therapy, uh, someone, we follow people going through the process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, a woman whose parents had been in the Holocaust and never talked about it. So she chose the story of Pandora's box and opened the box mm -hmm. and talked about it. So I think there's been a theme of that. So when you sat down and talked with your parents, what was, like, what was that like? Mm. Uh, it was really beautiful, actually. I, I'm so... Uh, in awe of the fact that they agreed to be in it and that they were so open, so honest about their own feelings of guilt 
50 years later, mm. my father still feeling guilty. Like, could he have done something? And um, when I ask him if he has anything to say and he says goodbye to his brother that he never got to say goodbye to, um, it's been very beautiful. And it's also, in a way, allowed us now to talk about Elihu. He's become a part of the family. It's no longer taboo or secret. So now I'm hearing about him. I'm learning what an amazing person he was. And, and my, bro my father's love for his brother, which he felt he couldn't talk about it because I don't think it was to hide it. I think it was more that, that there was shame in terms of guilt mm -hmm. and, and in terms of, as a society, it was something you just didn't talk about. And so they were still carrying that 50 years later. It was very moving for me to see that. And, and their courage, particularly my father's, to, to talk about that. Yeah. That was wonderful. So many families aren't at that point, though, yet, where they can, where they can do that. They, they still can't communicate like that. No, no. And sometimes they need help, too. And sometimes it's just very gently broaching the subject, you know? But I think if we took the shame and the stigma away from it, it would be so different to talk about it. You know, just like any other loss. Is there more we could be doing? As, uh, the, we mentioned that, that there are more community groups, there are more mm -hmm. public displays uh, and, and events uh, uh, now, but uh, what, what more could we do uh, to, to help address the stigma? I think it needs to be addressed in, uh, particularly in high schools, because there's such a high incidence among adolescents. But I think it needs to be addressed in a creative way that will be effective for adolescents. Yeah. I don't think it's a matter of saying, don't do it, mm. <laughs> right? Or um, if you see anyone, tell someone. That's all very important. But adolescents often have, it's very strong, it's very important for them to have friendship bonds and to feel loyal. So I think, I think in a way the arts would be a very important avenue for being able to address it in a way that doesn't feel like a lecture, that doesn't feel pedantic, that feels like something that, that's more of a dialogue and that can be engaged with. Um, I think that that's, I think, I think we need to address it with all populations, but particularly the marginalized ones and the ones that are high risk, seniors. LGBTQ, and also, you know, if you're being bullied, which so often, unfortunately, mm -hmm. le can lead to suicide, right, is to, to tell somebody about that, to have a zero tolerance for bullying. And, um, yeah. And uh, something that's been really uh, gratifying for me uh, about my film is that it's, uh, it's traveled all over the world. I've been really lucky. It's gone to festivals and, and cinemas. Um, but the audience response was surprising to me. Um, I found that it gave people permission in the audience to tell their stories, mm. often for the first time. At one screening, I had a woman who stood up and she said, I'm 84, and my mother died by suicide when I was 24. I've never talked about it until now. And everybody in the audience was just shocked. So for 60 years, she held it in because mm. she said she was too ashamed. And that the film gave her permission to talk about it. And that's been really gratifying for me because I feel like that's the kind of thing that can be helpful, is to give people permission to let them not carry the burden anymore of that, feeling like it's their fault, and that they have to be ashamed. And as a filmmaker, what could be more satisfying than a, than a moment like that where, yeah. where your film touches someone like that? Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't expect that. I, you know, you never know when you create something if anybody's going to want to see it. Um, but then I, I thought people might be moved by the experience of survivors, but I didn't know it would actually, people would take the next step. And that's been pretty consistent. Uh, the score in the documentary, uh, you wrote and produced um, yes, the music. Yes, uh, the original music. Um, there is one song that's an old song, which is something to remember you by, that one of the survivors sings. And uh, that was a song that um, his sister, who died by suicide, had told him about. And so that goes through the film. But all of the other music is original music that I composed. 
And um, the last song called Hold On um, is, is really dedicated to both survivors and to those that are suicidal. And it's really about um, knowing that you can, take, you can take one more step, one more breath, that just to, to, to just stay here for another day, basically. Because both those that are suicidal and survivors um, are suffering. You know, so it's it's really important that we be as present as we can for them, and that that song is available on my website um, for free to download. And uh, my goal with that is really to just get it out to anyone that it could be of use for. And for our radio listeners, your website they can find it at at www.yehuditsilverman.com. And we should probably spell that. Uh, okay. Yehudit. Y e h u d i t. Silverman. S i l v e r m a n. dot com. And if they'd like more information on suicide prevention awareness, uh, there's a, a wealth of it uh, that yes. they can find online. Yes. And also on my website, I have a list of resources as well that they can go to. And your next project, you're, you're <laughs> making, uh, you're working on your next film. I am. Um, I've got an exciting project that I've got 30 hours of footage so far. And it's uh, an interfaith project bringing together Muslims, Jews, and Christians, young adults. And um, I've already filmed uh, 21 young adults, uh, individual interviews, and then I brought them together for a workshop. So there were seven from each community. And I wanted to have people that uh, had a very strong faith practice. Because often with interfaith workshops and um, in the movement, it's very secular. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get people that are very strong in their faith. So everybody here was very strong in their faith. And it was very beautiful. A lot of the people had never interacted. Uh, some of the Jews had never interacted with Muslims. Christians had never met Jews. And uh, I had them each. It was all arts-based. So each group first presented their faith through the arts. And then we mixed them up. And we actually took the story of Abraham and Ishmael, Isaac, Hagar, Sarah, just as the idea, the themes from that. And they worked together to um, do another arts-based presentation. And it was so moving to see them forming bonds and, and, and understanding each other and negotiating differences. And I, I feel like the arts are a really powerful way of doing that. So I'm, I'm hopeful to get more funding, because what I'd like to do next is also to bring together um, religious and community leaders to do the same thing. And then I'd like to travel to Israel. There's a group there that of Muslims, Jews, and Christians that pray together every week. Mm. And I'd like to film that. Because we hear on the media the horrific stories right. of what's happening. And I think it's important to, to also note so many people who want to make a difference and want to get along and want to be able to negotiate differences in a positive, constructive way. Fantastic. What a wonderful project. We'll Hopefully, you. look forward to seeing that film. Thank you. Someday. And yes. you mentioned faith and, and how powerful. Uh, you mentioned the arts being powerful, but faith can also be mm. powerful when uh, for the suicide survivors. So we mm. saw in your documentary that mm. uh, that a number of them turned to their faith to to help them. Mm -hmm. Some of them did, and some of them never lost their faith. Some of them turned to it. Uh, I, I guess I would say one of the most important things is hope, which is. Uh, very similar, but even if whether you believe in God or uh, something larger or whether you find hope from community or relationship, but that sense of hope is essential and I think that's what we can give people. That's what we have to offer is to offer hope that it will get better, that we are there no matter what. And the sense of hope can make the difference between life and death. The documentary is called The Hidden Face of Suicide. You can watch it tonight if you're watching on Friday at 9 p.m. Then again this Sunday at 12 noon here on Mountain Lake PBS. Yehudit Silverman, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you. It's great to be here.